Hello there, welcome back to the booth here at the Magic the Gathering World Championships for 2018. I'm Marshall Cyclif, that's Paul Chion. Thanks so much for joining us for Booster Draft here. We're starting things off with Dominaria. And uh, let's take a look at our matchup here as we take a look at our first players going. Seth Manfield versus Martin Musa. So two titans of the game. A lot of uh, long-term success, but also recent success with these two players. And as you can see, we are entering into the very first round of action. Let's take a look down there as they're just about ready to get underway here, Paul. The matchup, I was taking a look at Martin's deck while you were looking at what Seth actually ended up submitting. I can tell you that Martin Yuza is on a black-green deck. Not super exciting. Uh, solid. It's probably going to be able to, to get him some wins and stuff, but uh, it's not really that great. What did, uh, what did Seth end up doing? Is he black-green? Or excuse uh, me, red green. Yeah, Seth did end up just with an aggressive red, red deck with a, a light splash on, uh, on on some of the green cards that we saw. We saw in Halar, we saw uh, a gift of growth. But yeah, predominantly a mono red strategy, just looking to curb out and punish slower decks. Uh, on the on the flip side, we have Martin Yuza. Now he's on a black green strategy. Um, you know, a little bit on the slower end. He's got a couple of filler cards. Easter Glider, not really the type of card that you want to be playing in a black-green deck. Certainly something Seth would be happy playing. Um, but, um, you know, Martin's got a, a handful of removal spells and just a, a Song of Freilis, which could also maybe potentially go along. But look at Seth Manfield right out the gate here with just uh, a crushing. very, very strong curve. Yeah, two drop, two drop, three drop. He's got Valduk currently Ooh, leading the way. And he drew way. a short sword. Oh, that is a nice rip here for Seth Manfield. We're going to see him cast the short sword and certainly equip it up to Valduk, and this is going to be a massive attack step for him. At least the 3-1 will get in, and then he's going to have to decide if he wants his Bloodstone Goblins to offer trades for the Deathbloom Thalid. That would, of course, leave a creature behind for Martin, but it seems like a favorable trade for Seth. He doesn't want to risk Valduk here, so he's going to leave him back, but still, that's seven damage coming in. Right, and so now Martin... You know, Deathbloom Thalid was a very good play for Martin uh, on this board. He gets to trade off a Bloodstone Goblin, and then he's going to get a Sapperling next turn. And if he, with the Sapperling, he can use it to trade off with the 3-1 Elemental token on the following turn. But Martin Yuza does need to hit his fourth land drop. As you can see, he's holding an Eviscerate in his hand, which he really needs to be able to fire it off on that Valduk with the Short Sword. Yeah. The Elemental will go away here. Uh, at the end of the turn, but he, but Martin's still in a very tough position because the Aether Glider, obviously a terrible blocker, and he now has a grand total of one power and one toughness on his right. side that actually is relevant to the board state that he happens to be facing because a race at this point is out of the question. Yeah. The, the, yeah, the, so that's the thing. When we were looking at Martin's deck, it, the gliders were the kind of the probably the worst cards in his deck because his deck really isn't especially aggressive. Yeah. As you can see, he's holding a mammoth spider. Oh, no. He just kind of wants to go over the top. Oh, he drew I both of them and he mm. missed his land drop here. Yeah. This is really tough because he has Eviscerate in his hand, Paul. He could have just killed Valduk with a land drop, but he didn't hit it. Right. And Seth's deck, on the other hand, okay, well, thought he was uh, stuck on. Uh, on, on a land there, but his deck can also function with a lot less lands because he is playing a very, very tight low mana curve with lots of combat tricks. So he, again, he is, this is kind of what Seth was hoping for. You can really punish decks. And is this just lethal? I think it is. It has to be. This is a kick to Goblin Barrage, sacrificing Bloodstone yes, Goblin to get the only block out of the way. That puts him down to five, and that's six damage coming in. Remember, Goblin Barrage can sacrifice any Goblin, including the one that Seth Manfield had on the battlefield. And with no blockers left, that's four damage going to Martin Yuza, plus three from Valduk, plus one from the Short Sword, which he didn't even need, and then three from the Elemental as well. Yeah, and during the course of the draft, we did discuss, you know, the, the merits of potentially taking Goblin Barrage over Shiv and Fire. We both said Shiv and Fire is a better card. But, you know, the reach on the Goblin Barrage is not irrelevant. And you saw that there. Seth has plenty of plenty of fodder to be able to kick this Goblin Barrage to get, for, kick, to get in for the final few points of damage. And he did exactly that. So that is game number one going to Seth Manfield here in the very earliest stages of the World Championship here in Las Vegas. Martin Yuza, not a draw that he wanted to see, and you see the first things leaving <laughs> are the Acer Gliders. Yeah, like, b basically basically going for any card instead of the, the Gliders. The Gliders are going to be very bad. If he's got, you know, any Grizzly Bear type card, just to be able to block and keep up with, uh, with Seth's board. All right, well, we're going to let our players get back to sideboarding. And uh, we're going to take a short commercial break. When we come back, we'll have game number two here from round number one. We'll see you in just a minute.
And welcome back to the feature match area here at the Magic the Gathering World Championship. I'm Marshall Seckliff in the booth with Paul Chion. Thanks so much for joining us for a little booster draft early in the morning here on day number one. And as you see, we are coming into Seth Manfield and Martin Yuza in their match. Uh, game number one, boy, if you went up and got a glass of water, you missed it. It was an absolute thrashing by Manfield, who had a pretty normal curve out, and then he found the short sword for his Valduk, which turned it into a darn good curve out. And unfortunately for Martin Yuza, a really tough draw for him. Not only missing land number four, which would have stemmed the bleeding significantly, but also he drew two copies of probably the worst card in his deck, Acer Glider. Yeah. That is the card that, you know, if you if you kind of briefly saw Martin use a sideboard and he just immediately put those two cards in his sideboard because he knows in this matchup, Seth is the aggressor. So he wants to put any spell in his deck that has any form of interaction that can actually block what Seth's trying to do. Okay, well, we're going to kick things off here in game number two. Martin Yuza, of course, going to be on the play here. He does have two swamps, and it looks like he's gone for the defensive route here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Just trying to get his block on with Rat Colony. He does have two copies of it. They're not in the main deck. Oh, yeah, but I... He, he can now live the dream. He probably took out the two gliders for the two colonies exactly. just to block those two drops. Well, before we went to the break, Paul, we saw the first two cards out were the two gliders. Ah, oh, Forest on turn three. The reason why I say that, by the way, Paul, is because I saw Swamp Swamp, and uh, in Martin Uses' deck, he does have a Dreadshade. Ooh. We could have seen a turn three Dreadshade, which is pretty pretty big problem. There's Yavamaya Sapper now for Manfield. Yeah, <laughs> this is one of the reasons why you do not you you don't see Rat Colony being a commonly played card. A lot of Thalids going around, you know. It's just not the best. Oh. But again, Martin just wants the block. Oh, it's terrible. It's really bad. Really bad. But again, trading on the ground for even something like a Bloodstone Goblin, you'll take it. Right. What Martin wants to do at this point, or at least in this matchup, is just play a bunch of creatures early. Try to stem the bleeding, and then just start dropping your giant green creatures, which hopefully will be good enough to kind of stymie Seth's offense. You know, the dream that I remember thinking about um, when I first saw the format with Rat Colony was Tetsuko plus Rat Colony. <laughs> um, That's a pretty it never lame happened. dream. Of <laughs> like, like, the dreams to have. That's like bottom tier dreams. Dude, that's like you get three rat colonies, one Tetsuko. They're all unblockable. <laughs> Come on, man. Just let me have my dream. All right, fine. It was kind of bad. Um, this is a card, Windgrace Acolyte, that went up and up over time in the format. It right. turns out, you know, the life gain is always nice, but the mill yourself for three ended up being more and more important the further we went into the format. Absolutely. You know, the more and more uh, Windgrace Acolytes you have in your deck, you know, the, the more and more, like, other cards go up in value. And if you're black-red, cards like the Chronicler, you know, it gives you additional ways to put spells into your graveyard to get it back. Also, cards like Soul Salvage, right? Soul Salvage goes uh, much further up in value with a card like the Acolyte. It was a card, though, that we saw in Javier Dominguez's draft where he really did not value the card at all. Uh, he had multiple, uh, um, uh, op multiple chances to take copies of Wingrace Acolyte relatively late in packs, but he just chose not to take it. Well, there's that rat colony. <laughs> now it's staring down a fire <laughs> elemental, which is one of the lower end cards, honestly, for Seth. You know, a, a, a curve topper type card, but nothing exciting yet. It looks pretty good here, to be honest. And it's going to, in fact, earn an eviscerate from Martin Yuza. And Martin Yuza's hand is uh, fairly mediocre here. He's got a Corrosive Ooze, a couple of lands, and a Lanwar Envoy. So. Wow. I got to say, you know, Martin's deck, I mentioned at the beginning, it's, it's medium quality. He does yeah. not have one of those WoW style decks. It's pretty baseline. But man, he has really not drawn the good stuff that he does have, because he does have some good stuff. It's all rat colonies and Aether <laughs> gliders, and now he's got Corrosive Ooze. Yeah. Uh, another card I'm assuming he brought in out of the sideboard. No, I'm wrong. He has that in the <laughs> Oh, main. no. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's got a lot of these filler creatures, but he's got some, you know, some decent quality cards, too. He's got a couple of Caligo Skin Witches. He's got a couple of Eviscerates and that Dreadshade that we were talking about. So he has ways to end the game. Um, and also, he does have a singular copy of Song of Freilis, which it looks like is the best card in his deck. And, you know, I've definitely seen that card just single-handedly just swing games around. You know, you just, it's like, oh, yeah, I had this mediocre deck with a bunch of creatures. Oh, I drew Song of Freilis. It's over. Yep. 
but wow, the kids keep coming here for Martin Musa, Lanamar <laughs> Envoy now. <laughs> And Seth Manfield with just a totally stacked hand here with a Shivan Fire and a Wizard's Lightning. Yeah, Shivan Fire, of course, lining up so beautifully against Martin Hughes' entire game plan thus far. He hasn't played anything more than uh, two toughness the whole time. Yeah, so Seth Manfield just kind of deciding what he wants to Ooh. do with his removal spells because, like, even if he uses his Shivan Fire to get creatures out of the way, he doesn't really have a good attack. So I think he's probably just going to hold on to the Shivan Fire and save it for a larger threat that Martin might deploy in a future turn. Boy, I, I got to say, I just got to take a minute here. I got a feel for Martin Yuza. <laughs> like, ooh, I think that was a good draw. Maybe I spoke too soon. I was just, it's just like he has drawn his worst cards in an already medium deck. He's kind of flooding out now. Uh, He's just sitting here staring down a board that's getting worse and worse for him, and he doesn't really have a game plan, but he did just rip Soul Salve. Wow, that is a very, very yeah. good draw. Yeah, so maybe I'm uh, going to start cheering for him <laughs> a little harder here because he could get back two copies of Wind Grace Acolyte. Is that a, I think that might be a Dread... Is that a Dread Shade in the graveyard? That might be a Dread Shade. Like, the first Wind Grace oh, Acolyte right. might have made a Dread Shade. So this is a huge you Soul Salvage. Right. And we yeah. talked about the value of Wind Grace Acolyte just kind of going up over time. And this is the reason why. It synergizes so well with Soul Salvage. And I think when you look at a lot of the color, uh, the color pairs and the colors, you know, oftentimes... What you need to look at are just the the synergies that you have within the colors because that allows you to just kind of um, increase the overall value of your deck because the cards work well together. So once again, Martin's just going to be mana efficient here. Now, the, the upside to flooding <laughs> is that you can play your Soul Salvage and you can play your Wind Grace Acolyte in the same turn and even have a mana left over. It was a Dread Shade, as you noted, and he got that back as well. Also, he can use the uh, the Lanowar en Envoy to use his two forests and turn it into an additional Black, hey, black, black wow. Source for that Dread Shade. Wow, you do look for value in all Just, places. You got, you, well. got, you got to. You got to. I'm impressed. <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that is narrow value. I love it. Thin value. Yeah, the thinnest. Now, Seth Manfield played Valduk, Keeper of the Flame, last turn, which is very scary, generally speaking. But he doesn't have any way to, to enable it, at least yet. Yeah, he's, he, I mean, we saw the whole draft. He only has a short sword. Mm -hmm. So he's playing it just as a kind of a, a cur filler card, but. And Seth Manfield going to play it safe here. Play around uh, Blessing of Bells and Lock, I guess. And, uh, well, he's got, a a uh, he's got the Goblin as well, which gets plus one, plus one, and Menace. Oh, he has a Goblin. <laughs> when you Very kick nice. the spell. So this is going to line up an attack for five. Now, there are trades available to Yuza. And I think he will take advantage of that. He can't wait to trade off for the Rat Colony. Oh, yeah. That's he's probably like, the best did, possible. It was half a card. It, it got the Sap Herd, which still left the... A sapling in its wake, but that's right. Here comes a giant, giant. Oh, and that's a it's another swamp. swamp, which is not the best, but at the same time, this dread shade is just gigantic. It will be huge. It's a little hard. The the, the forests look a lot like. So there we go. Thank you, Martin. Look forests. at this. Look, yeah, what look at a, that. What a team player. So he's got five swamps and a pseudo swamp. So he's he yeah he can he can pump it up to a nine nine this turn if he wants. <laughs> and then on the next turn he can start crunching in for twelve what if he the? so chooses. Also, Martin has uh, bolstered his life total significantly thanks to the uh, Wind Grace acolytes. He's still at twenty even after right. taking some hits. Yeah, and red green specifically. I mean, I think it's going to be really really difficult for. Oh wait. Never mind. No. That's a haphazard bombardment. Uh, here we go. We're going <laughs> to we're going to spin the wheel here and see what we can uh, get rid of. Haphazard bombardment is going to uh, put some aim counters on as they're called, Paul. All right. And then at the end of Seth's turn, one of those things, as long as there's uh, at least two permanents with hand counters around, will go bye-bye. All right, so... I think we know what, what Seth's rooting <laughs> right. for. Let's there's, see if he hits it. <laughs> there's a 25% chance this Dread Shade dies right here. Let's see if it goes away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah so, um, trigger this. Yeah, sure. And then, um, and then um, one, two, three, four, and then five to six, we roll. So he's looking for a three. Nope. No, it's a two. All right. So that's the Lanowar Envoy going away. 
Right at this point, though, Seth has plenty of chump blockers, so yeah. this haphazard bombardment is going to do a lot of work. Yeah, but Martin could dodge it all three of the other times. Remember, the last oh, right, encounter right, right. Course, doesn't go away. <laughs> Seth has a very good chance to deal with it. We'll see who's luckier. I'll tell you that. <laughs> and what is what did Yuza find? Oh, Caligo oh, Skin Witch big. with Kicker says you discard two cards. Thank you very much. Can't quite tell how many. Oh, we can see he's got three cards in hand. So Manfield is going to have to get rid of a key removal spell and one of his lands here. So now, yeah, he's deciding between the Barrage and the Wizard's Lightning. The Barrage does deal more damage at this point. So he might choose to keep that. Neither of those cards is going to be able to deal with the Dreadshade. Although there is also the consideration of oh, keeping Wizard's wow. Lightning up and blocking with a ton of creatures yes. and trying to finish it off. Hey, you have to take your medicine sometimes. <laughs> That's what he's going to do. He's actually going to keep the less powerful option. Also, if I'm Martin Yuzo, I'm like, yikes. Wow. He's like, what is that last card? No kidding. I'm curious if Seth just wants to sit back. And just hope to, hope to roll that three, get that right. shit off the battlefield. Because if he does, then he's in great shape. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> it's kind of funny how crazy the swing is here, too. If he rolls a one, he gets a two-two off the battlefield. If he rolls a four, it's just a land. Right. <laughs> but if he rolls a three, it's Here we the go. most important oh, card. Want Needs. You want to put a two on that, and then just. Oh, so now it's one, two, three, four, one, five, two, six. Three, four, five, six. Yeah. Four, yeah. Five, six. So now he wants a three, three or, or a four. four. What is it? Oh, oh he, he hit the dread shade. shade. Oh, oh man, tough luck for Martin Yuza. Down goes the dread shade. And that was, of course, the key permanent on board, and it was really the focal point to Martin Hughes' entire game plan, and it's now in the bin. Absolutely. And now Seth Manfield can actually start attacking at this point with some of his creatures. Uh, uh, and the draw step he had was actually quite strong. It was a gift of growth. So very, very good combat trick in this situation here. He does have a Bloodstone Goblin in play as well, which can... Uh, has that sneaky ability that you don't see all the time triggered, but it's whenever you play a kicker spell, it gets plus one, plus one, and menace. So Gift of Growth, can, uh, in conjunction with that, can uh, be, very, uh, be uh, pretty uh, difficult to play around. It looks like Seth drew another Valduck, so he might just choose to attack to try to get a trade so we can play the second one. And it's not obviously a bad, bad attack either. All right. This one's less important, though if it does hit the land, that does help Martin out. I'm actually surprised here. Uh, I'm surprised that, so is that Kurosavu's a th Three, three? No, oh, no, no, sorry. That's a name that, counter. Yeah. I thought it was a plus one, plus one counter. Okay, I know. so that makes a lot more sense. I, I had that a minute yeah, ago, yeah, yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Especially when the Dreadshade had a three on it. I'm like, wow, it's already a six. Oh, no, that's right. a name counter. But at the same time, it still kind of makes sense to block there because once you block there, the bombardment doesn't do anything, right? Uh, that's true. If there's only one aim counter left on a card, it doesn't trigger. Right. But I suppose he was also just hoping to lose the land there and keep the creature instead. Which he did, though. Yeah. This is a little <laughs> oh, awkward no. for Martin. He's finally the found his song, of, his song of Fraley's, which is his, actually his strongest card in his entire deck. Uh, he did get to keep the Corrosive Ooze. That can matter. Yeah. Cancel that order. Wizards, uh, Wizards Lightning's going to take care of the Ooze and perhaps clear the way for more damage. Manfield also recognizing that uh, you know, the more creatures that Martin has with Song of Fraley's out, the better it is. And I think he's uh, going to start lining up for battle here. Ooh, and Ooh, another spell, a Warcry Phoenix. Okay. Yeah, that helps. Martin is sitting at a reasonably comfortable life total currently. He is, but yeah. boy, this one is starting to slip away from him very quickly. If Seth offers the trade with Valduk on the ground for the rat colony, Martin's basically obliged to take it. Martin can then block 1-3 on 1-3. 
yeah, I and think, take the two damage in the air. Yeah, it's 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 a, it's a rough spot. Song of Frailies is just disappearing. Yeah, Martin really wants the Song of Frailies to pump one of the creatures, but maybe he just wants to take the trade here because this is so much damage. Yeah, I just think he kind of has to. Like the the truth of it too is that even if Song of Frailies goes to chapter three, he's not winning the game off of that. Oh no, I mean, Seth's at sixteen, so he does make the trades uh, as we described them. Takes the two in the air. He did find a creature or something here. Goodness mm. sakes. I, you got to feel for Martin here. Again, his deck isn't fantastic anyway, but he has really just peeled. Right. I mean, that haphazard bombardment was huge. It was Seth awesome. Yeah. I was going to say, red-green has a really difficult time dealing with other large uh, large creatures because a lot of the removal that you have is just like, you know, red burn spells, three damage, four damage, and those effects would not have been enough to get that dreadshade off the board. Yeah, Martin is way too far behind here. Seth Manfield has put together, you know, not super synergistic, but a very focused red-green deck, right? This is straight up a beatdown deck. There's no qualms about it. It has combat tricks. It has creatures to attack with on the ground, and it has removal spells. It's, and a, it it's, doesn't it's what we around. call honest magic, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. Mana curve, combat tricks, and removal. Yep. No frills. No. And, you know, I got to say... It looks really good here because he's facing Martin, who, as I mentioned before, is playing a bit of an underpowered deck. And Seth Manfield is just muscling him here. Yeah, definitely. So Martin's going to exchange some life total here by taking all of the damage in order wow. to try to maintain his board state the best way he possibly can and try to get a little value out of this Song of Frailies. Sure. He figures this is his best chance to win. And there's the second copy of Valduk after having traded off the other one last turn. Yeah, and if you look at Seth Manfield's hand, he's also holding a Keldon Overseer as well. So if he draws oh. the seventh land, he can get in for a gigantic attack next turn. Yeah, he's going to take, what, four damage here, drop down to 12. Remember, the creatures get Vigilance and Indestructible, so it's basically free for Martin to just attack with them. Land? So Martin does yeah. have uh, much better blockers now. He's got a pair of two fours on the battlefield, which uh, has a very nice sizing to the rest of Seth Manfield's board. But of course, we see that Seth does have a gift of growth in hand. Yeah, it looks like he's got a lot of ways to get the job done here, especially if he's drawn a land for the turn. Ooh, he drew Halar the Fire Fletcher. Oh, so he's going to be setting up a... Yep. A very, very powerful effect next turn with Halard the Fe Fire Fletcher and Gift of Growth. Yeah, or the Overseer. Or the Overseer, right. That has right. Kicker, too. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, a good defensive card. And finally, a, a nice rip here for Martin Hughes as well. He finds a Mammoth Spider. But I'll tell you what, if this is a land off the top for Manfield, I think we're just about done. It's so much damage if he can kick the Overseer. The Hellar, the Fire Fletcher, will trigger. That'll do a damage to Yuza and make it into a 4-4. Four, four. He'll add a 3-1 haste to his board. He'll take away a 3-5 blocker on the other turn. The Bloodstone Goblin will trigger and become a 3-3 right. three, three with Menace. It's just a ton of extra damage, though. He does need one extra land to make that happen, and it doesn't look like he's found it. It feels like Seth drafted kind of like a red-green pseudo-prowess deck. It's yeah. just all of his spells are just kicker spells. Right now, and he's just looking to see. Yeah, I think he's just looking to see, can I just kill you just using Gift of Growth? I might not even need this Overseer. Right. Another option he has is just to simply play the Overseer. Right. But yeah, Seth getting in here. Gift of Growth representing... <laughs> I'm not even going to try to do the math here. But there's going to be two unblocked attackers, and if Seth just thinks that Martin doesn't have a removal spell, I think that's just lethal. So as you can see, Gift of Growth here kicked will give, can give one of Seth's unblocked creatures plus four, plus four until end of turn. Two creatures will get through, so that'll be a minimum of eight damage. As um, even if the Chronicler doesn't get blocked, one of uh, one of the other creatures that Seth has on the battlefield is a two-powered creature. So that'll be three plus four. Oh no, that would be seven. But of course, Halar also has the the triggered ability. Martin probably taking Gift of Growth into account here as he looks at trying to survive. 
He's not in a position with nothing in hand where he can try to go for any value or anything like that. You can't play around anything at this point. Right. He just. uh, I hope you don't have it. That's right. He has to assume that Seth Manfield doesn't have a card just Boom. like this, and he yep. absolutely does, and that's going to do it. Martin Yuzik extends the hand, and Seth Manfield back on that road. We saw him win this tournament back in 2015, and he's off to a good start here. Dispatches of Martin Yuza. One thing that we'll be talking about more as we work our way in today, especially into day number two, but that we'll talk about here as well, is the kind of record that you need to make it on Sunday mm-hmm. is actually... Not quite what you would expect when you are used to watching Pro Tours or especially Grand Prix. You can get people that make it at 9 and 5 sometimes. Right. And also, a lot of it also depends on if there is a player that's completely crushing the tournament. Because that does open the window for other people to squeak in at, you know, potentially nine wins or, or maybe even eight wins. It's, you know, those are all kind of up in the air. We've had tournaments where Seth Banfield just completely dominated the field and had like one loss going into the top four. Right. Uh, and the same thing happened, of course, last year with William Jensen just going undefeated until the later rounds of the tournament. All right, well, we're going to take a look at John Wolf versus Javier Dominguez. Now let's check in on them. Oh, boy, we got a board state going here. So let's see what we have. Another red-green deck this time for John. And on the other side, I see, what do we got? Amaranthan Wall. Oh, boy. Drudge Sentinel made the cut here for Javier. Hmm. Is this yeah. game three? He may have brought it in against the big green creatures on the ground. And it looks like he is, wow, he's actually about to win this game, isn't he? Academy Drake has John Rolf down to one with no blockers and Javier at a cool 12 life. This is kind of it. Oh, and Javier's in that beautiful position. Kick right. Skin Witch to clear the way. And this right. is going to tell us right away if John Rolf has an answer for the flyer and he doesn't but he is going to be able to gain four life from invoke the divine even though javier can just simply save his wall (laughs) it's not enough and that's going to do it javier domingos takes this match two games to one with his blue black deck we did of course get a chance to watch him draft that yeah it looked like he had a fairly rough draft um you know he had a blue black deck and one of the issues with the blue black deck is that a lot of the power of your deck relies heavily on your uncommons and rares Mm. because uh, just frankly at at common there's just not enough good synergies there and a lot of the cards that are good for example in black um in other archetypes are not so good in blue black control dalit omnivore is not a card that's as good if you're drafting blue black and even a card like wing grace acolyte javier had no interest in taking that card during the course of the draft. Okay, well, let's head over to uh, another one of our tables here where we got Brian Brown doing, and he's playing against Gregory Orange here in round number one. Looks like we're just heading into, well, maybe game three. Yeah, and if you just, ha- with, with, with the last look in, if you know that the game is going to go long, you do know that Javier will be able to win, he, or he will have the inevitability. He has three divinations and a dark bargain. It's just, you know, is he going to get run over? For example, I think his deck is going to have a really t- difficult time dealing with Seth Manfield's aggressive red-green strategy. Yeah, very straightforward beatdown plans tend to work well against right. those clunkier decks for sure. Okay, well, let's get underway here in game number eh, probably three. Good assumption. It's the mirror. Hey, I did it. It is game three. <laughs> Mesa Unicorn here for Greg. Orange is going to kick things off. Not a, not a type, not the type of card I would associate with Greg, generally speaking. But hey, it's limited. You do what you got to do. Yeah, it's a good little card too. Greg saving, likely saving his islands for the tournament. As uh, as as long as I've known him, he's basically only played control decks whether they've been good or bad in the format. Skittering Surveyor evokes a cry of jealousy from the chat. Yeah, I mean, every time somebody plays that, you're like, you got one of those? That must be nice. It's nice. You opened it, huh? Yeah. (laughs) In the meantime, the curve out continues for Gregory Orange. He's got Davin and Trapper to follow up that uh, unicorn. It's like a little chit chat from the players, too. We'll listen in as they... Talk, but this is a Ooh. nice play here. Cavalry yep. has arrived for Brian Brown doing two 2-2 two, two Vigilance Knights are going to really shore up the ground game cleanly here against Greg. Yeah, that was, you know, basically the perfect 
card for Brian to have in that situation. You know, Greg had a nice curve of the Unicorn to go with the Trapper, and the Skittering Surveyor is not a great blocker against that board. And if Brian deployed any just normal creature, Greg would have had the opportunity to play a historic card to be able to tap it down with the Trapper and get in a big attack. But because Brian put two creatures on the battlefield, Greg has to kind of wait on that plan. Interesting attack here from Brian Brown doing because Gregory Orange decided on his turn four to play Stronghold Confessor with Kicker. It's a 3-3, and uh, Brian like is just unabashedly attacking into it. And we're going to see Gideon's reproach on the offensive here from Brian Brown doing. And if that's the card that Gregory Orange was playing around, he's going to be happy he made that block. He saves himself two damage by doing so. Right, he, you know, Greg's in a spot where he's like, look, if you have the combat trick, I want you to use it now, which could also potentially slow down your board development, which wasn't the case because Brian did follow it up with a courser. Yeah. But there are situations where like, yeah, use your mana, go ahead, save your creature, but now you're not, you're not able to play your four or five drop in your hand. That's right, it was a Pegasus courser as a follow up for BBD. He's gonna pass the turn back to Greg, who has kind of an interesting take here. That's a Mishra's self replicator, I believe, yeah. All right. So whenever you can, you can see it there. When you cast a historic spell, you may pay one. If you do, you get a token that's a copy of this. But of course, they all have that ability as well. So it can get out of hand very quickly if you can string together some uh, some historic spells. Right. As a baseline creature, well, not really where you want to be at yeah. two mana five five or two two for five. Two mana five five, I think I'd prefer. But two mana five five is reasonable. I yeah. would I would play that. I would put that in my draft decks. Okay. Yeah. Hot take. I'm a little scared that you think it's reasonable and also work in R&D. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Something coming out we, soon? We got to give uh, some kind of a drawback. Uh, <laughs> sa sack of land? I don't know. <laughs> I would still put that in my uh, deck, by the way. Yeah, maybe I would, too. Uh, uh, attack with everything and get this flying. Oh, man. Flying Skittering Surveyor here for Brian Brown doing as he beats. attacks with the team. He's happy to make trades on the ground with his knight for either of the two blockers, potentially. No risks this game. Greg. Uh, <laughs> no yeah. shenanigans. Interesting that he says that. I wonder if he uh, opened the door last time and maybe uh, got punished for it. It's possible because he did have a very strong play this turn. He could have played a Juggernaut, and then with a Courser, he could have had a Flying Juggernaut next turn and getting for oh, a ton of damage. Wow. So he really was, you know, trying to play around the fact that Greg could have a historic card, but if he didn't, he could have had a much better play. Right. Now he's going to see two-thirds of his hand disappear because there it is again, Caligo Skin Witch on the stack now for Gregory Orange, and uh, the trigger's on the stack. Yeah, this is Maybe a tough spot for, for Brian because all of his spells are quite good in this current spot. These two. What did he pitch? Well, it looks like he's discarded... Juggernaut and the Sergeant. So he yeah, kept the Sergeant seal away. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, yeah. It's tempting to keep the Juggernaut, though when you do look across and see a three-powered creature, it does look a bit worse. Yeah, and he's still able to jump one of the two creatures that, he's out, that he has on the battlefield. Sure, the Juggernaut gets in for a little bit more, but seal away is a premium removal spell. And if Greg is able to turn the game around and get in for a big attack, seal away is an answer. It's true. I, you know? I, I would have been tempted to keep the Juggernaut because I have the Courser. Yeah. You know, yeah, just, yeah, definitely. Just bang, bang, and the, and the game's over. Uh, it doesn't look like Greg is going to be uh, turning his creature sideways anytime soon. And if I have a Juggernaut attacking, I don't mind if you do. That's just six a turn. That's a right. turn clock. Now, it is a little bit more fragile of a plan. If he kills the Juggernaut, you're kind of left with less. Maybe if Greg uh, draws some type of bomb or something along those lines. Right. But uh, Brian has settled in for a much longer game as a result of that decision, and we'll see how that works out for him. All right, so now he has everything and give Surveyor flying. Still offering trades on the ground for either of his 2-2 two -two creatures, and it looks like Greg Orange is finally going to okay. at least take one of those. I gain two, you take two. Yeah, so he made that attack because, yeah, if Greg chooses to Trapper block, he, he is going to be trading. There is no profitable block that Greg has in that Good spot. Bird. Baird is the follow-up play here for BBD. Doesn't look great here. I mean, sure, it's fine, it, but it can't actually get through the Skin Witch, and, of course, Greg is not in a position to start attacking at this point, so, well, eh, whatever. And Greg very flooded here. Yeah, it looks like he's uh, declined to miss a land drop in a while. I think that one might have been another call to Cavalry off the top there for BBD, and we'll find out shortly. Yeah, I, I expect the same attack that he made the last turn, jump the Surveyor attack with everything. Greg can... 
Oh, sure, sure. You can give the token. It's, it's an extra damage, yeah. Right. Yeah, if Greg had a removal spell right. or one of the other two power creatures. Exactly. Two, three, four, though, is the hit. Ooh, big spell oh, here. What do we got? Guardians of Coilos. He's got Guardians of Coilos, a 4-4. Four, four. And he's going to go for a little value here, pick yeah. up the Skittering Surveyor. Why not? Ooh, but invoke the Divine for Greg Orange. And he's actually probably relieved to find a better target for that than the uh, Surveyor itself. Yeah, I, I, you know, Greg was probably a little bit sad that the uh, Juggernaut was discarded. Uh, oh, you're right. Good skin witch because he did draw invoke the divine the turn after. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> would have been a clean answer. Yeah, wow, still not missing those lands though, are you, Greg? Yeah, who knows what that card is. Yeah, Greg really just needs to find an answer for that courser, as it's just been chipping away at Greg's life total. In the meantime, excavation ele elephant with kicker. That's going to get him back the uh, the Mishra self replicator. Ooh, okay. And BBD actually kind of made a little joke to him. He goes, "You got one card in your hand," and he said, "It could be anything. It, it could be anything." <laughs> Still, BBD has to feel okay with just the self replicator. That's not a problem on its own. It's a historic card coming off the top that could make it ugly. Yeah, and keep in mind, Greg's uh, uh, Greg's life total is now sitting at ten, mm. and. You know, the Replicator just makes a bunch of ground tokens, and Brian's sitting at a healthy 24 life. So if Greg can't find a flyer or a removal spell for the Courser, Brian can still just end the game in a few, tur in a few short turns. Looks like a lingering phantom here for uh, Greg Orange. Yeah, very, very close to a two-turn clock here. As this turn, Brian can attack with the Courser and jump either the Baird or the 2-2 two -two, uh, Knight token, getting for three, putting Greg down to seven. And then the Lingering Phantom means he can get in for a six in the air on the following turn. He has one of his own. Yeah, he does. Yeah. So both players with Lingering Phantoms now on the battlefield. But uh, like you said, I like BBD side a hair better. Again, the uh, Pegasus Courser having done significant work yeah. over the course of this game. If Greg can find a flyer here or an eviscerate, he just really needs to find a removal spell or a way to deal with that courser. Ooh, <laughs> look what he found. He found a little bit of value, but still needs to find an answer here. Brian's got a two turn clock here with the courser. That's right. So this is the big problem because right now Greg Orange is set up to go off, but that's not what he needs to do. What he needs to do is find a copy of eviscerate or something along those lines. Yeah to get that flyer out of the air. And he is going to have to use it on the flyer, isn't Seven. he? Right. So on the, f on the previous turn, like this turn, it he would have been fine if he actually drew a big flyer because he could have blocked the Courser and then everything's OK. But now Greg actually needs to find a removal spell because yeah. now Greg's down to one life. And he's going to be facing two flyers from Brian on the following turn. Yeah, also a wide board on the ground now for Brian Brondwin. But here it is. This is a big draw step from Greg Orange. He's got to find a way to kill that Pegasus Courser. Uh oh, what do we got? He's tapping some mana here. Well, he also has the golem that he can use to get another card. I see Manipulator. I see, oh, that is that's just a what draw. the doctor ordered. He wow. can use that to keep the courser at bay and keep the ground going. Right. And he gets another Replicator. It deals with the go wide board that you were also talking about, too. That was the perfect draw oh, from Greg Orange. Oh, my goodness. Greg has a legitimate chance to come back now. That was the perfect draw. I can't even think of a better draw. Wow. Look at Brian Brown. He's like, no way. Did this really just happen? I mean, Greg is sitting at one, but now any historic spell, and he gets to just go off with that replicator. Yeah, I mean, he's got four of them right now. This is where the flood comes in handy. Right, and Brian has already used <laughs> and invoked the divine in this game. So even less oh. likely that he has a second copy to deal with that icy manipulator. Now, Brian can find another flyer, which would be lethal. Yep, yes. any flyer's good. And Greg is still not in a great position to attack yet, unless he finds another If he finds a historic spell, spell though. <sighs> yes. That was a memorial to folly. OK, does he have? I don't think he has a historic card to get back. He could maybe chump attack with an artifact creature if he has one in play. He 
He does. The he golem. has the golem. It, that would also get him a card. But that does give Brian a, a better chance to draw a flyer as I well. I know. I don't know yeah. what you do. I. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, actually, Good yeah, assumption. He. It looks like the lingering phantom might get in, though. Ooh, we might see a trade here. That means Brian signifying that he has a historic spell to get it back. Sure. We'll trade off. I'll play um, Right of Bells Unlock and pay. Oh, okay. So that's an extra flyer. That's Right of Bells Unlock. Yep. Right of Bells Unlock is going to get him two O one one clerics for the next two turns, but then a big flying demon. Right. And that is lethal. So there's a very real clock on Greg Orange now. He's Now he's that's back in the position of needing to find another removal spell. Or maybe f go back-to-back -back historic spells to turn it around and get in a huge attack. But that Baird is also keeping things a little <laughs> bit at bay as well. Did he just find his own copy? Um, what? Okay. No way. He might have found his right own of Rite of Bells Unlocked. Unlock. I didn't get a Is this just the, the Stone Cold Mirror? No, really? Yeah. It is! <laughs> He's got his own Rite of Bells Unlock. Which is going to trigger the Lingering this is, Phantom. And this is unreal. And he gets to make four more <laughs> Mishra's Self Replicators. He just drafted Black White Tokens. I mean, that's just obviously laughing. a powerful play. Bells and Lock Mirror Match. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we were thinking, BBD. Wow. All right, so how does this work, Paul? So. Now it's Brian's turn. He goes to Chapter 2. Goes back to Greg. It's Chapter 2. Goes back to Brian. He gets a demon, but it doesn't have haste. Right. Then, then it goes back to Greg, and he gets a demon. <laughs> and he gets a demon. So then we're just, we're just stalemated again. But Greg is Unreal. building this gigantic army of uh, uh, replicators. He's got eight on the battlefield now? Well, this game is sweet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's definitely a sweet game. <laughs> Brian is like, Brian's, would have Brian preferred a little excited. less sweetness on this one. <laughs> he had Greg down to one. But one, as we all know. going to play the Phantom. Not zero. Right, right. <laughs> Tap the Pegasus. All right. Pass a turn back. Greg. We have any more clerics? I'll draw I don't think they expected this many cleric tokens to be on the battlefield. <laughs> no kidding. They're going to have eight on the field total. What a mess. Look at this board state. This is, this is just unreal. I'm just curious if Greg can find himself another historic card at this point, because the replicator then starts to get very, very threatening on another activation after that, right? Like There is a Baird on the battlefield, though. So he does have to pay one for, for every creature okay. that attacks. So he can't just make this huge all-in attack once he gets a huge army of replicators until he finds a way to get the Baird off the battlefield. Traxos was the draw <laughs> from Gregory Orange. What? Which is, of course, another historic card. How much is he going to pay? He's he needs pay, to leave one up right. <laughs> for the uh, Icy. He's keeping up one for Icy and will pay the rest of the mana that he has available at this point because he has so many replicators on the battlefield. Wow. He actually ran us out of our fake replicator <laughs> tokens. <laughs> like He ran us out of, yeah, proxies. Those like, weren't even real, <laughs> Greg. Come on, bud. <laughs> All right. So now we're going to see a, a demon now for Brian Brown doing after his draw. Demon. Brian is still not out of it, though. He All he needs to do is just draw another flyer at this point. Yeah. If he just finds another flyer or a removal spell <clears throat> to deal with the, the Bells and Lock token, yep. then he, he's still going to win this game. Totally. And Greg still isn't really in a great position to attack yet. No. Yeah, Baird doing a good job, plus the board is just completely stalled out. Yes. Yeah, an Eviscerate is good. Just right. something, something like, simple like that. Up. I mean, we have this advantage bar, but if we had just, like, sweetness yes. bar, it would just be full red oh, yeah. on Greg Orange's side. Definitely. He is like, this is up. just the dream. I, I don't think I've ever seen this many replicator tokens ever. Yeah, that's because most people can see by the time they... <laughs> 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 All right. Do you, do you have a second demon? <laughs> just here. You can have this demon, and I'll have that. You have too many weird tokens. I'll just take that one. <laughs> <laughs> This is insane. Uh, oh, man. <laughs> Can Gregory Orange come up with another trigger? I mean, his historic triggers also untap Traxos at this point. Right. At this point, he doesn't need to, but I think Greg might, at this point, 
might have to be thinking about, you know, um, if it's profitable for him to make a big attack just to get in for some damage. But it looks like Brian just has... I mean, Brian's ground... To be fair, Brian's ground forces aren't huge. He's got a lot of small tokens. He's got a couple of honor guards. I mean, Lingering Phantom is the only real... And yeah, Baird are Baird, the only yeah. real creatures that can, you know, just gobble up some of these 2-2s. Two totally. Yeah, he's got a bunch of O-1s. Um, everything else has two toughness or less. I suppose the demon counts, too. Right. Okay. He could also start just getting in with the Lingering Phantom if he wants to play it slow. Right. Well, Lingering no, Phantom's going to hit the battlefield player. again for Greg. Um, Maybe Brian will just run out of tokens to sacrifice. Maybe that's how this game ends. Yeah, I think he <laughs> might run out of cards in library. <laughs> we know Greg's not going to run out of tokens to sacrifice. Yeah. Play. Oh, this is interesting. Is that Dauntless Bodyguard? Dauntless bodyguard. Wow. So he can use it on the demon so that now Greg can't trade demon for demon. Oh, wow. So I guess he just starts tapping the demon. No, no he, he can't, can't because yeah. the, the, the Pegasus yeah. will jump something else. Right. So this was actually a huge draw for Brian Brown doing because now Greg is compelled to block and effectively trade off for the Dauntless Bodyguard, meaning right. that once again, BBD has two wow. lethal threats on his side. This was such... That was... That was basically like drawing another flyer there. That was swords to plowshares. <laughs> <laughs> just but, get but, rid of it. But better. But no life. No, no life. Yeah. Yeah. Greg would have loved six life there. Oop, yes. Don't untap that one. All right. So this is a huge draw set for Greg. He has managed to find his way out of this situation oh, yeah. multiple times. He needs a removal spell <gasps> or a big flyer. Oh, it's now, a he's got a Howling Golem. Top. He's oh, got yeah. a Howling Golem in play. He does. So One he... more shot at it for Greg Orange. It's desperation time. You got to do what you got to do here. You got to get in, draw that card, and see if you can find a removal spell for that courser. Land. I think he's also just first deciding, hey, do I have an attack that could actually kill? I don't think that he does, right? The Baird really right. limiting what he can do, even if he could get in with all of his replicators. It looks like, I mean, just by his body language, it looks like he's like, what am I attacking with here? Am I just getting in with everything? Well, you know, if, if he figure like, if he's not going to go with the Howling Golem plan, then there's nothing left but a Desperation All-In right. attack, but I feel like, the I feel like you go for the Golem. Yeah, the Golem plan seems like the, the most likely way to get out of this. Yeah, there's no way that he's going to be able to kill BBD from 24 this turn. Right. He's got to pay one for this attack. Yes. All right, here we go. Okay, this is it. That is a Gideon's Reproach. Oh, that is not going to do it, right? No, it's not. Wait. So it is not. It is not because no. he can tap down to Demon, use a Reproach in the Courser, but the Courser will jump something else. Yeah. If he taps down the Courser, the, repro the Reproach is not enough damage to deal with the Demon. So I think BBD has this locked up. I do, too. Oh, he even found so a removal close. spell, too. It's uh, just not the right yeah. one. I guess you make him do it. Yeah, might as well. Greg looks kind of worried, and he should. That's the best Dauntless Bodyguard I've ever seen. Oh, yeah. <laughs> He's going to use his memorial to get back the, uh, the golem and put it back into play, which does get him mm -hmm. a Traxos trigger. At this point, BBD has got to be thrilled because so Greg just has almost. less mana up here, so he can't be representing a card like Blessed Light. Yeah, and, and BBD will certainly go, well, what if he has this? And No, that doesn't work. Seal right. away wouldn't work either. Time to jump something and attack, and that should be it. And that's going to do it. Brian Brown Dewin takes the match two games to one in an epic game three finisher that saw, well, some unlikely heroes, shall we say. <laughs> oh. A Do lot of tokens, a lot of tokens. Yeah. I mean, that was a really fun game to watch. It was, and yeah. the Dauntless Bodyguard, you yeah. know, effectively acting as a one-man removal spell I so. right. I mean, I was think absolutely play, fantastic. But just so, so much back and forth. It looked like Greg just didn't have a chance. And then that Icy Manipulator just completely kind of turned, turned it around. You know, he, we were like, is there actually a chance for Greg to turn this around? 
But, uh, I mean, BB BBD had a lot of turns to find ways to kind of get in for that last, last point of damage. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Cool, cool stuff down there. That Mistress Self Replicator <laughs> almost. 12. 12 tokens. Distance. Only 12. And he could have had more uh, by the end. But in the end, it didn't matter. It was Brian Brown doing who took that match. And that is going to do it for the first round of draft here from the Magic World Championship. We'll be back with more right after these messages.